the NAACP. On February 12, 1909, what is now the nation's oldest and largest grassroots civil rights organization was formed. The NAACP, which stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, has been a driving force in fighting race-based discrimination in the United States since its founding. In 1909, racial injustices were common. Segregation was legal in many parts of the United States. Employment discrimination was common, and voting rights were often denied. People of color across the country had to live with the fear of racial violence and lynching. And so, the NAACP was formed, built on the ideals of another group, the Niagara Movement. W.E.B. Du Bois, along with 29 other prominent African Americans, started the Niagara Movement in 1905. They met near Niagara Falls and wrote a manifesto calling for equal civil rights, the end of racial discrimination, and the full recognition of humanity for people of color. In 1909, many white liberals in New York City joined with some of the Niagara Movement's black intellectual leaders. And from that group, the NAACP was born. In addition to W.E.B. Du Bois, other NAACP founders included renowned civil rights leaders Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell. The NAACP's mission has been to achieve a fully integrated society with equal rights for all. Its national leadership has always been interracial, even though the greater membership has been mostly African American. To achieve its mission, the NAACP has not only focused on using the legal system to challenge discrimination, but also on convincing all people of the need for racial equality through speeches, organizing, and legal advocacy. Since its inception, the NAACP has had a long list of legal accomplishments and successes. The NAACP's first challenge was fighting Jim Crow laws, which maintained legal segregation. In 1915, the NAACP was instrumental in outlawing the Grandfather Clause, which allowed white people to get around literacy tests that were used to prevent people of color from voting in many states. From 1920 to 1938, the organization flew a flag outside its New York City offices with the words, a man was lynched yesterday, to call attention to the rampant lynching occurring in the United States. In 1954, the NAACP's chief counsel, Thurgood Marshall, successfully argued the case of Brown v. Board of Education before the Supreme Court, ending the legal segregation of schools. During the Civil Rights Movement, the NAACP co-organized the March on Washington in 1963, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. The NAACP lobbied for the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which outlawed discrimination and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which made it illegal to deny people the right to vote based on their race. Today, the NAACP remains actively committed to fighting discrimination. Its scope has widened to include fighting inequality in economics, healthcare, education, voter empowerment, and the criminal justice system. To this day, the NAACP continues to serve as an important legal advocate for all civil rights issues. As we look at this rich history, the oldest civil rights organization in the United States, I'm pleased to have Reverend Shaw on the phone with us. And Reverend Shaw, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Inglewood chapter of the NAACP? Well, the Inglewood chapters had uh, people who have, have gone on from its branch to become political leaders and things, the platform that the NAACP can set for us um, it can, can be tremendous. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to first of all thank you for having us on the show and doing this for the branch. Your human trafficking uh, program, your committee is, is absolutely leading Inglewood right now. You're bringing awareness to this that even our mayor got some credit for, and he had to set the record straight that that was us that did that, not him. And so what you're doing, um, what your co-host is doing, the work that you're doing exposing and making people aware is just uh, needed so much, especially in the black community. The fight of the NAACP in the Inglewood area really is just beginning. Um, there's a lot of people who want to help, but there's not a lot of people who can help. 
people like you, people like me, a lot of folks that are listening right now who could participate, we can bring life to an organization that you have already admitted has been silent. The silence is probably just based on not knowing what to do and not having the proper information. And so what we're doing in Inglewood is we're creating the programs that we need to address the issues of our community. We're partnershiping with the Citizens Commission on Human Rights and the Kiwanis Club and the American Legion. And so we're trying to get organizations to head up the different committees that we have uh, we want to take it into a new era and restore the freedom fighting mindset that uh, was traditionally with the NAACP that has, like you said, it become silent. And unfortunately, a lot of time we are like everybody else. We follow trends instead of looking into the future and seeing what is actually having the most impact. We need researchers and people like that to actually uh, go in and do like you do and get the proper data and information so that when we present ourselves, there is no dispute on the issue. There is no um, uh, argument over the quality of treatment that we're getting with our kids versus other kids. You brought to light that, you know, one uh, white girl, and I'm not saying this from a racist point of view, can be all on the networks, but there's hundreds of black kids that are missing and going through abuse and nobody's talking about it. So I just want to commend you and I want to commend your co-host. And I just want to say this is such a needed thing. And I ask the audience, really, think about it. Not only contribute to organizations like the NWC, but contribute to this program. Because this, we need the independent voices to speak up. We really do. We really do. And, and uh, Reverend Shaw, you're, you're stealing a little bit of our thunder. In the fourth segment of this show, we were going to talk about the number of African-American girls that are missing. And I don't know if you are aware, if our listening audience is aware of an organization, they are called Black Girls Missing. And they report that over 40% of all missing people in the United States are people of color, and yet they receive 1% of news media, 1%. And that is, that is a show like this. Like if a show like this was to um, begin to publicize that this particular person of color is missing in the United States, that is the publicity that a person of color would receive about being missing. And so we're gonna talk about that in segment number four, but I wanted, as we begin this, I wanna introduce the topic to you. And, and one of the roles that I have in my life is I have the privilege of being the education editor of an international magazine. It's called E, the magazine for female executives. And this magazine, we, we publish this magazine and we reach about 3.8 million people all over the world. And in November, I wrote an article titled The Civil Right to Be Free from Sex Trafficking. And in this article, if you have a chance, you can pull it up on the internet. You can go to E, the magazine for today's female executives. And if you go there, it will, I explain to you all of the atrocities that a young person faces in sex trafficking. I want to highlight this, the two words that I used at the top of my article, which is the civil right. And it's at the heart of this matter, if you ask me. And when we are talking about human trafficking, and especially when we talk about minors, we are talking about as a baby, as a child, as a teenager, you have the right to grow up without being raped 15 to 20 times a day. You have that right. And I don't know if the world really recognizes that, that when we, when we take children and put them into human trafficking, you not even put force, coerce, lure, trap, abuse, um, you are taking away their civil rights. And I, this show is our way of 
of informing you of how that is to be so. And so what can you expect to hear on the anti-trafficking uh, show uh, hosted by myself, Dr. McNeil and Ms. Christina Fitz? Well, we're so excited to bring to you, we're gonna bring to you lawmakers. We're gonna, in a few weeks, we're gonna be talking about AB 218, AB 629. We're gonna actually bring on our show the individuals that made those laws. And how do those laws impact our community? There's also an organization here um, nationwide, it's called Zero Child Abuse. We're actually gonna bring them on and we're gonna talk about how we can get zero child abuse um, as a part of our anti-trafficking efforts. Um, so we're so excited to bring, to bring with you the lawmakers and those individuals that are writing policies for the nation, the, those individuals that are, that are running nationwide organizations. And if you can hear the sound of my voice and you say, well, Dr. McNeil, I'm, I'm a part of the NAACP here in Washington or in Iowa or in Texas. We need for you to join the conversation. Call us, 877-227-0880. And so that we can bring this information to every community in the United States. What Christina and I want to do is, is we want to be able to have a nationwide conversation on human trafficking and how we can fight against it, how we can stop it. And so we want to know what's happening in Tennessee, what's happening in Iowa, what's happening in Houston, what's happening in, in Chicago, so that we can help collectively to stop it. Across the United States, law enforcement officials are fighting an international crime said to be worth $150 billion in illegal profits. It's a high volume, low cost business. We're told the highest they charge is $35 for that 15 minutes of time. And oftentimes the trafficker will count out the condoms that he gives the girl at night and then count when, when she comes back how many are left. And so I'm so excited uh, to have this groundbreaking show, a nationwide show to talk about anti-human trafficking. And so what will happen after every broadcast? After every broadcast here on More Radio Network, we will produce a podcast. So you can go to More Radio Network and have the podcast for this radio show. But don't be afraid. Call us today. Join the conversation at 877-227-0880. So now we, talk, we introduce the NAACP. I also want to encourage you. If you're out there and you say, well, Dr. McNeil, I want to do something. I don't know what it is I want to do. No matter where you are in the country, I want you to simple Google NAACP and then put your neighborhood. NAACP Houston, NAACP Boston, NAACP um, any city. Google that, pull up their information, and just for $30, you can join the oldest civil rights organization in the United States. We don't make it hard. We don't make it a financial hardship. Even in the midst of COVID-19, you can afford the $40 to join the effort. Why do I think that it's important that you join the effort? Because if we are all not fighting and continue to fight for our civil rights, we're going to see those rights slowly eradicate from the American fabric. And I know if you're African American and you can hear my voice today, you already see some of our civil rights being eradicated from the fabric of the United States of America. And many of you, I, many of you will call me later today and say, Dr. McNeil, we're not, you didn't even get into that. But this show is about anti-trafficking efforts. And so we want to, we want to jump down deep down right now and talk to you about what is human trafficking. So if you didn't have a chance to, to listen to my three-day expose on 
human trafficking. We're going to take a moment now here in segment two of our show, and we're going to go down and dive in deep and talk to you about what is human trafficking. And I'm so pleased to have with me in front of me here in the studio audience, out the Los Angeles Civil Grand Jury did a report on human trafficking in Inglewood and the surrounding cities. And I'm so pleased that uh, the vice uh, chair of my committee in the NAACP, Ms. Patricia Patrick, she actually wrote, she chaired the writing of this report. So uh, Ms. Patricia Patrick, if you can hear the sound of my voice, thank you for this document. But this document goes over what is human trafficking? And so we know here worldwide, I want you to hear this number, worldwide, what we can guesstimate, what is a low guesstimate is this, this atrocity, and they call it a business, is a $350 billion business. They say business, I say atrocity. So if you can hear that, so Dr. McNeil, what are you talking about? I'm talking about an anti-human trafficking effort that is geared to dismantle a $350 billion industry. So you ask, well, Dr. McNeil, why is it an, an atrocity? Because human trafficking is broken into two areas. One is labor. That is when a minor or an adult is forced, coerced, or by defrauded into um, a mandatory labor. So they have to work at whatever industry this is, and they're forced to do that. Some of these individuals don't eat, some of they do not get breaks, and they most definitely do not get paid. And so one of the ways in labor trafficking that they keep you, they move you from one city, one country to another country. And the reason why you're stuck there is that they destroy your passport. They keep your passport. So now you have no way of getting back to wherever you came from. And now you don't even know where you are in your surroundings. That's labor trafficking and labor trafficking can <laughs> I can't even believe this. It can include child labor. So many labor trafficking, they are bringing women to the United States and other countries, and they are farming them to have babies as a part of their labor. And can I cut in with that on labor trafficking too, is because when we also think about labor trafficking, we think about people who work in sweatshops and we think about people who work in factories and things in that nature. But we also have to think about when you're going to your grocery store and you see little kids walking up to you and they're asking you to buy candy for 50 cents or to sign up for a local magazine subscription or something like that. That is considered labor trafficking. Yeah. If you have a young child walking up to you trying to sell you some perfume or some incense, that is labor trafficking. I had a youth come up to me in a grocery store parking lot and ask me if I wanted to buy some candy for a sporting event. And we know that schools are shut down right now. We know that if they are in middle school or something like that, that's provided from the school, not unless it's a park. And usually parks will provide that information. And then when you ask this youth, where is your parent or how did you get here? They can't tell you any of that information. That is a sign that they are being labor trafficked. So we need to be aware of different things like that that's happening in our community amongst our little you know, um, African and Hispanic youth. Right, and even so much so, Christina, when here in Los Angeles, um, and I see this a lot in Los Angeles and Texas, but I don't see it in other states. But here in Los Angeles, you can drive by a street corner and there will be someone with a cart cutting up fresh fruit and you can buy a fresh cup of fruit from that person. And I don't know if, if many of, of our Californian citizens are noticing, but lately 
those individuals are not able, not only not able to speak English, but they have no real idea of where they are. So I, I live close to a city, um, Diamond Bar, and we used to never have those um, individuals selling fresh fruit on the corner. And I recognized as I was going up to the fruit stand that many of these women are from Malaysia or some other place, or, or they speak Thai. They, and, and here in California, we always associate that with um, some other group that's trying to just make a day rate of money. But these were actual individuals who had no idea what city they were in, or, and they could not talk to me for an extended amount of time. So that, that was a telltale sign that this person is under some type of coercion or some type of force. If you are the only person standing at this fruit stand and the person is looking around frantically trying to make sure that nobody sees them talking to you for an extended amount of time, something different is happening here. Does that make sense? So that, that's one thing that we want to make sure that we give the public as well is so what are these red flags to look for? What are these red flags in your community? If you're in a community, I want to, we talked a little bit about labor trafficking, but also if you're in a community and you see a large group of people entering in, and we saw this at a, a big operation here in Orange County that was shut down for labor trafficking. A large number of individuals were going into a factory as if they, and they did do the work of the factory. And then a large group of in, individuals were exiting all to get in the same van and to go away. And after the sting was done, they found out that all of those people, over 50 people on a regular basis, were here illegally and forced to do this labor. Can you, I mean, it's happening in broad daylight. So I don't want you to think that this is happening, like Christina said, it's happening in broad daylight at your grocery stores. It's happening in broad daylight as the van is dropping these individuals off. Just ask yourself, have you ever seen a large company where everybody in the company drives to work in a large van? I mean, some of it is, is just asking the public to just ask another question. And so that's labor trafficking. And we also want to talk about sex trafficking. This report gets into sex trafficking of men, women, and children that are forced, fraud, or coerced into having commercial illegal sex um, for money. Now, I want to define this a little bit more because especially in the days of um strip clubs you know it, here in america we see tons of commercials or videos of girls in the strip club and we've kind of um from my generation to my son's generation we have uh we've taken away what we what would be a taboo about working in a strip club or being a stripper or those kind of things. Not only is it taboo, but we've also taken away our radar of what's actually happening in those clubs. Does that make sense? We now it's just, oh, well, that's what they want to do or that. And so we've kind of taken our radar off of that to, to make this more of a thing of choice. But I want to, before I get to the strip clubs, I want Christina and I, if we could talk a little bit about, about sex trafficking of children, women, and men. And Christina, can you, uh, I want to make it plain for our audience, kind of what I did on our um, expose last week is we talked about what is sex trafficking? And so I want to make it plain for ch children, for children who are forced, coerced, lured into sex trafficking. What we're actually talking about is a child that is being forced to engage in sex with anywhere from 10 to 15 men a day money. 
and they don't receive any of that money. And here on our podcast, I want to go to a video that I thought um, and on our radio show, I want to talk to you about a video that is on YouTube that I really think makes it plain. And the video is titled, A Stranger in Plain Sight, A Stranger That You Know. And it shows a young girl, a Caucasian young girl, who's going to high school, and she's a little bit not in the, the in crowd. And here's a stranger that's always at the school and he's befriending her. And then he, he um, this is what we call when you're lured in um, through a Casanova pimp or a Casanova abuser. So he's taking her to dinner, he's buying her things and she's experiencing and feeling this sense of belonging and love that she never did. And the video shows that at first, this young man, it appears that he's her boyfriend. Like, you know, they're going out to dinner, Christina. He's buying her stuff. He just appears to be her boyfriend, a little older, but appears to be her boyfriend. And so then he asked this teenage girl to have sex with him. And she, her face looks like she kind of wants to do it, but not really. But he's so nice. He's so nice. And so she does it. And that's the first catch right there. When you see yourself, if you can hear the sound of my voice and you're kind of, but he's so nice to me, but I really don't. And the moment she has sex with him, he then begins to talk about, you know, how he's fallen down on his luck and he needs her help. And is there any way um, she could do, it kind of shows them talking back and forth. And then he takes off her, um, her hoodie jacket and, and so she can go out and have sex with someone else that he has arranged. And then it shows him making arrangements for her to have sex time after time with truck drivers and in hotels and this is the same guy that's picking her up every day from her high school so i want to demystify this for our listening audience christina i want to make it plain when we think about sex trafficking of minors um in our mind we go to movies like taken like somebody's gonna come and take them away but we're talking about something that happened right there in front of the school he was right there in front of her high school, picking her up every day. Among us And they won't back down They can 
And so as we talk about, and as they talk about in this report, sex trafficking and labor trafficking doesn't just happen to minors, it happens to adults. And we wanna talk about the men and the women who are forced or coerced, lured into this atrocity of, of sex trafficking. Christina, can you, can you shed a little light on that? This is crazy. Yeah, so you have a lot of what you just um, described was pretty much like a grooming process. And then this girl felt that she had to um, perform for her boyfriend because she wanted to be loyal and stay down for this individual. And so that tends to happen to a lot of young youth and even grown adults as well is because we are social people and we're all looking for a form of connection. And so based upon some of the influences we have, whether it's the TV influences of the love and hip hops or it's the rap music that our young people are listening to, it's always influencing that the woman has to be down for the man, that we have to be a ride or die, that we have to do all these things. And if your basic needs are not being met at home, rather you don't have food, clothing, shelter, um, heat, those basic needs, then you will go and seek them other places. And so we have a lot of young youth who are growing up in the foster care system, who are growing up in one parent households and who are out here searching for love and affection and attention from men, whether it's old men or young men. And what they're realizing is that men, love is um, equivalent to sex. So I can't receive love, not unless I'm doing something sexual with my body. And so now you have a whole bunch of young youth who are saying, hey, if I was abused in my home, I didn't have any control over my stepfather or my mother or whoever that abuser is that's in my home front. When I go out here and I become, when I'm starting to be trafficked, I seem I have a choice of who I get to sleep with. I seem I have a choice on, you know, the prices that I get to charge on the things that I tell the the buyer that I want, whether it's a car, whether it's, you know, fake hair, um, all these material things play a part in human trafficking. And we don't look at it as in everybody's a key player. The hotel person's a key player. The Lyft driver's a key player. The nail salon lady's a key player. The swap me where we go buy our go jury is a key player. All these people are getting money off the backs of boys and girls having sex. And the problem is that these kids don't realize it's a problem is because they're under the age of 18. And so they're just out here being promiscuous. But in law, you can't legally consent to having sex with a minor not if she's under the age of 18. So you have a lot of people who are not looking at these young girls as minors because a lot of them don't look like minors. A lot of them look a little bit older, but if you have conversations with them, their conversation doesn't add up with their self image. And so, that plays a role in human trafficking. So that's why we need to take resources and we need to feed them into our communities and really support our families so that our children aren't out here being exploited. Because I'm gonna tell you, no girl woke up and said, I wanna come out this morning, I'm gonna be a hoe. And the same thing goes for a little boy. No little boy grow, grew up and said, I'm gonna wake up one morning and be a pimp. He was groomed into a pimp probably from the society because he didn't have no black man to show him what it's like to be a man in his household. Or maybe he was abused himself. There's so many underlying things that are happening within our community that we don't even have information or resources on generational trauma that contributes to human trafficking on the boy's side and on the girl side. So that's why as a community, we need to come together and educate both because we can't knock one down and say, oh, well, we need to save our little girls from trafficking, but we're forgetting to save our little boys who are the ones that are trafficking our little girls. It has to come hand in hand. Right. And I think it's not only just hand in hand, but it goes right back to our legal system. Our yeah. legal system now knows that the number one trafficking organization in Los Angeles is our gangs. There are gangs. So the, the gangs went from uh, drugs and guns to people and they traffic them all over. It's not just gangs, but it's other organizations. Um, uh, the mafias, the 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 organized crime is it's all of those individuals that have taken gone from drugs to guns to now to people. And well, what was gangs doing before drugs? Because we always want to put gangs and drugs in one thing. Before drugs hit the gangs, the gangs were for the community. 
They gave community food. They gave community childcare. They gave community a lot of more resources and then they got populated with drugs. And then once the drugs came out of the community, they had nothing else to sell. So then they went to sell their sisters, their girlfriends and things like that because they are- the was we have to talk to about, them. Christina. But no one talks about the gangs being the community leaders and being the ones who brought the communities actually together. They were the foundation for some of these now. communities. That's, a, that's the thing about it. They, they, they haven't been doing that, Christina, for the longest amount of time. So I'm going to go they to when I, was, when I was a little girl. When I was a little girl growing up in America, it was more people trying to sell you drugs than trying to give you a free meal. The, and, and that I'm just keeping it 100. So if we're going to talk about, if we're going to be the NAACP and talk about civil rights, I'm not willing to say that the gangs are, are community leaders. They're not. They have infested communities for, for decades now. So it doesn't- They I haven't. When it's I say, the government when I say, who has infested they may have the community. Yeah, they may have started somewhere, but they sure as hell, I mean, they sure as heck did not end up there. Does that make sense? It's like, it, it, I wouldn't be a part of the NAACP if the NAACP started fighting for civil rights and then they became drug dealers, I wouldn't be a part of that. And I'm not gonna espouse the NAACP. So we, we as a people, we as African-American people, we have to have more fortitude. I'm not gonna highlight who you were yesterday when who you are today is destroying my community. I'm not gonna do that, Christina, because one, I don't wanna glorify who they are. Because if you meet a gang member today, they're not, do, they're not giving away free meals. They're not giving away childcare. That is, it, we have to acknowledge that. But if you walk into the NAACP today, from 1909 until today, they're still fighting for your civil rights. And that's what I hope that many people get from this show that as brown people, as people of color, we've got to go back to who we were. We got to go back to the fortitude that we have for each other. We are the only ones, and I say this to the younger generation every day, like, oh, we took back the N word. Well, did we really? No. Did we really take back the N word? I'm using the N word because we took that word back. That word doesn't mean what it used to mean, really? Because I haven't seen a change yet. The only thing I've seen is more people calling each other that, but I haven't seen the word change. You, you wouldn't feel warm and fuzzy if someone used the N word to you at work. So I haven't seen it change. We haven't taken it back. So I know we're on a whole different topic than our topic, but this, I'm so but, glad. Yeah, Go ahead, can, I, can, I, can I inject right here? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I just want to clarify because I get where that viewpoint came from, that the gang members, but I grew up with many of the gang leaders because my age group was where the Crips founded, the Bloods was founded, things like that. What they did in society is they got what the Black Panthers did on a social justice front, and then they attributed to other gangs because I was, I knew the leaders of these gangs. I, I was very close. I'm in documentaries with these guys and stuff. So it's not they what they did do most of them started to protect their community and then like a lot of people when they got power they abused the power but uh the idea that the gangs actually started and they were doing food that's what the panthers did most of the gangs didn't and they have gotten our social activists mixed up with gang members and they've meshed them together and now they're uh, creating a new history so, you know, as a person who was there, who later went into law enforcement, um, the idea of protection of community is absolutely correct. The idea that they was out there doing so social justice actions, for the most part, that was not true. Because in the 70s is when they, the killing started, all of that stuff. Then we got the crack cocaine that started a whole different war, which was injected in by the CIA. But in the beginning, most of these gangs were not socially conscious groups they but the panthers became labeled as a gang right and they weren't a gang they right. were a social activist group right and if you ever do the the history of gangs the the you'll see that there were black gangs in the 20s or the 30s 
um, running, running heroin, running this. Like they didn't start, the gangs were not the social justice movement in our black community. We've always had, just like every other community, we've always had an underbelly of individuals that were doing crimes and infesting the community. Um, I forget what that what what Netflix movie that is, but um, uh, Forrest. Uh, oh, uh, Godfather of Harlem. Yeah, the Godfather of Harlem, and I think that that time zone was the '40s and the '50s. But that showed the underbelly of the black community in the at the height of the of the Harlem Renaissance. Does that make sense? At the height of what was going on in Harlem, you had this underbelly of black gangs doing what the underbelly always does. And so um, I know that you know, like everybody else, and like every other community. Every community in the world has an underbelly to it that is always doing something to the left that is harmful to the community. And for the history of the Black community, we've, all, we, we've had gangs in our community, and they have been the underbelly. And then we have social activists that have been trying to move the community forward. But and I'm so glad that we're having this dialogue because it's a way to correct history. It's a way to correct what young people think or how they idealize this word gang. But the gangs have never been that. Just keep walking back in history. You can keep walking back to when African-Americans were freed from slavery. Walk back to the number of black people that tried to recapture, recapture another other black person and, and force them into labor. Well, I mean, we've always had it. So we're no, and I don't want to, I don't want to be labor there, but I don't want us to stay there and say that it's our, our people. You know, we hear this all the time, black on black crime. That's not what we're here to talk about. But I want to talk about that we are a people. We are just as diverse. We are just, we have different ways of thinking different ways of communicating, different things of living, or different ways of being. But one thing that we can't be is the catalyst and the predators and the victims of human trafficking. We just can't be that. That is something that is destroying the very fabric of our community right before our eyes, right before our eyes. So I wanna talk a little bit about the need for community involvement. And I wanna bring this right home to where we are here in Los Angeles. If you're listening, I can see on the monitor here that several people are listening. If you're listening and you wanna join this conversation, I know we got a little, we went a little bit off into another area, but if you wanna join our conversation, please call us at 877-227-0880. We, need, we have a need, a great <coughs> for the African-American community to get involved in human trafficking. If you, go, if, uh, if you go nationwide and you see what an activist for human trafficking looks like, you're gonna see so few people that look like Christina and I. You're gonna see so few. However, when you go to the victims, when you go to the survivors of human trafficking, you're gonna see people who look like Christina and I in an overwhelming number. And so I want to, I, what this show is the catalyst of this show is to do is to, to encourage our communities to get involved. And one of the ways that I like to start our conversation with encouraging you to get involved, and this is it's this historical look at how black women are looked at. When we see a young black girl, a young African-American girl, 13, 14, 15, 10, seven on the street corner, we don't say, oh my goodness, look at this baby. What is happening to this sweet little baby girl? Somebody call the police. A baby girl is out here on the street corner. Our language tends to be, she fast. She, uh, she, you know, that's what she wants. That's not my business. So I, that's where I want to start, Christina. I want to have our community look at our young Black girls and young Black boys. When you see them on the street corner, 
I want you to change your verbiage and I want you to get involved. I don't, I'm not saying get out of your car, keep driving, but I want you to dial 911. And I simply want you to say, there is a baby standing on the corner of this street and this <coughs> street. Someone get over there. Does that make sense, Christina? Yeah, it does make sense. But in reality, is that that's not something that's going to happen because that's not considered. So we can call law enforcement, but how long is it really going to take for them to show up and come into that corner? You know what I'm saying? Because it's not considered a non threat, life threatening emergency. You know, so I've been in positions where I've called and said, hey, I think this person's being trafficked and they take the information, but they don't come right away. And so that's a problem is that we need to be able to have direct contact with like either that task force that's in that community or that law enforcement agency that's doing patrol in that area so that you can make sure that when you're having those calls or making those calls that those girls are, or boys are actually, you know, being serviced. And I think that that's where we need to start because what you're saying is an atrocity. All of our taxpaying dollars go to pay the police. So when I hear you say, but in reality, that's not going to happen. Well, in reality, that needs to happen. So if we need to change how many police officers are going to readily respond to that, then yeah. that's something that we need to change. But it is unacceptable for me to hear you say, oh, you could call the police, but they won't respond. But that's a little girl out there getting raped 10, 15 times a day, and we're not going to respond. I think as, as African-Americans, we can't be that complacent. We can't say, well, they're not going to do it, call the task force. But that's are they not there to protect and serve? They are there to protect and serve. But if you're not an immediate threat and say, for instance, they have four other calls that day and say someone was shot or whatever, they're going to probably send the officer but to the shot person before they go send it to somebody that you suspect to be human trafficked or you suspect to be a minor even though we know and we have this yeah. um, i'm not validating it and saying that that's you know how it should go but that's why it's important for us as you know task force members to make sure that we are educating our law enforcement and making sure that even if we don't report it when they're out there on patrol they're stopping they're saying hey what's going on why are you here and they're doing routine checks being vigilant on what's going on as well one thing I was able to do was we were able to do a training with all the Inglewood Fire Department. And so having trained all the fire department and the first responders on what to look at and signs and things like that, we were able to gather information and see that they are usually when the you know police are called, they come out as well. And they were able to, to see like, you know, hey, we they've identified victims at different motels on Century Boulevard. They've identified girls, you know, walking down the street and things like that. And they were able to assist them with getting help, taking them to hospitals that are not in the city, but further out the way so that the trafficker will probably have a hard time finding the girls, you know, just certain little things like that. And so education is the first key step, because if I'm not aware, I'm not going to look for that. Right. But it's also enforcement. So I agree with everything that you just said, except for that the police should not respond. And so I'm going to say when I say enforcement, I mean that in every community, there's not a shooting going on in every every second of the day. That's a that's a false statement. That's a, and I don't care if it's even the most impacted statement because I have worked with South Central PD. I've worked with LAPD right in South Central LA and there is not a shooting going on every minute of the day. So I don't want any excuses. But if that little girl is out there, then the police need to respond. And I think that as African-Americans, we always go, well, somebody could be getting shot, an emergency could be happening. We give an excuse before we even hold people accountable. Well, I want to know how many people can respond. How many people in your police department responded to a shooting versus how many people in your police department responded to these calls? Because to me, a little baby being raped on your street corner should be, should have Sound an alarm. But can I interject here, uh, Doc? Uh, sure. This is where the organizations like the NAACP and the National Action Network and 
so many of our community groups, this is where the ministers and stuff, these are the type of issues that we all can come together and put pressure on the mayors and the chiefs of police and things like that. You guys are exposing the information, you're fighting the fight, but the rest of us, if the police are not responding to the call that we have children out there, that's when we supposed to go into action to protect our community. Because you guys can't do everything. But I can get an audience with the chief of police of Inglewood. We can get to, to uh, Michael Moore in LA. So we can, and they have money for task force. So somebody is supposed to respond. And if they're not responding, we have to find out why they're not responding because they respond to everything else. They respond to a black man walking in a white neighborhood. They explain, they, they, they respond right. to that. So they can respond to a child on the corner. It's just that if we don't create the hoopla behind it, then they don't respond. The squeaky uh, wheel gets the grease. So I think Not that is the squeaky wheel, but to also put it into law. Because what when Christina said that, everything in me just rose up. I don't understand why are we paying? Why are our tax dollars and a large portion of our tax dollars go to law enforcement? A large portion of our tax dollars go to all of these city and government agencies. So if all of these city and government agencies are not going to value our children, we can't sit back and say they protect everybody but us. We've been saying that for centuries, but we don't have to accept that. And that's why we are part of the NAACP. So if you can hear the sound of my voice and you say, well, Dr. McNeil, our police department doesn't respond. We need to hear from you. Call us here at the station at 877-227-0880. I, mean, I wanna make a list of police departments that's not responding to little babies. Now, just imagine, now I'm, I'm, I'm at a contradiction here, okay? This is, I'm at a contradiction. If, if, a, if a child is being uh, abused or neglected, we bring that child into the foster care system so everybody can make money. But if a child is obviously standing on a, on a street corner being abused, we're not going to respond because everybody is still making money. So I, I'm, I'm at a contradiction here. If we see someone, especially a baby, standing on a street corner, is that not a, a at, at the minimum, is that not neglect? How come we're not in, investigating that? We can't sit back and say people don't respond. I'm, then if you if you see a child being neglected, <clears throat> should we file charges against you? Have you watched it happen over and over again? See, now here in the state of California with AB 218, if a child has been sexually abused and anybody who knew about it and let it go on, that child can name you in a civil lawsuit and bring you to court. Read the law, that's 218. We're gonna actually have them on our show in two weeks. So I, I'm, 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 I'm baffled by this and we need, probably need to talk about this a little bit more. Because you can't tell me if I call you to say, go protect that baby, you're not coming. But if if, if somebody you calls come, you- But you're going to come, it's going to take you a while to come. And that's going to be the thing, is that if it's taking you a while to come, that child, by the time you respond, might not be there. And right. so we need immediate response. We don't have time to- that's what we have to fight in for. 15 minutes. If you're calling and I'm like, hey, I think this is human trafficking, human trafficking, you need to respond within 15, 30 minutes because- that youth might be gone, that youth might be relocated, that youth might, you know, right. be jumping in out of a car by the time you, you get there and won't be there. Right, so we have to have rapid response. And if that's something that we need to advocate for on this show, thank you for highlighting it, Christina. Thank you for bringing it to our awareness because we need to highlight that. It, I don't understand it, that we could take children away from homes, but we can't run out there to protect them. I don't understand that. And, 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 and it doesn't make sense to me. That I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. When we hear the term missing persons, images of 
Kaylee Anthony, Dale Dinwiddie, Lacey Peterson, and Natalie Holloway immediately come to mind. But what about persons of color with similar fates such as Desmond Reed, Shelton Sanders, Constance Anderson, and Stepha Henry, who did not get the same coverage? Due to this disparity in awareness and coverage, the public is misled into believing that the typical victims of abductions and kidnappings are white and female. Black and Missing Foundation was born in a time of necessity. Close to 40% of all missing persons are of color. Our mission is to ensure that missing persons of color receive the exposure needed to be reunited with their loved ones. We want to hear our stories. If you ask most person or an individual, have you heard of Unique Harris? I'm sure they haven't heard of Unique Harris. But if you say, have you heard of Chandra Levy or Kaylee Anthony, the, an image comes to mind immediately. So as Derricka indicated, we need more diversity in the newsroom and we need to create a partnership with the news media. It's not just building a website that we built and people can just turn to it and upload their families on there. We're educating them. We're wanting to bring them home. We are wanting to have the search teams to go out there. We're wanting to have the hotlines available. We're wanting to do the awareness campaigns. Education is just so important. But on every show, we want to make sure to give out our national hotline. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is 1-888-373-7888. Again, if you are involved in this at all, or you see a baby on a corner, or you see a, a young lady and you see her going into the strip club and she looks absolutely miserable. You can't figure out what some, excuse me, something strange is going on with this young person. I want you to call 1-888-373-7888. And they're open 24 hours, seven days a week. Seven days a week, 24 hours. Where we, that is our nationwide human trafficking task force. I'm telling you, I, I probably overplanned this uh, radio show. We didn't even get to the last two topics. Is we end in about two minutes. But I want to encourage you to join us every Saturday here at 10 a.m. Next week, we're going to be talking about on the 18th of this month, next weekend, we're going to be talking about AB 629. So for all of you individuals that you have found yourself in this horrific atrocity, I want to tell you about a new law in the state of California that will help bring, in my, I hope, I pray, it will help bring a little restitution to your life. I know we can never get back we can never get back what, what these vultures have stolen from you. But we want to talk about this law that we have now on the California books to, that I pray will help you. We're going to next week, we're going to go through the legal journey. How did this law become so? We're going to take you through an eight-year legal journey of fighting for the rights, the civil rights of victims of human trafficking and how this law became so. And then we're going to walk you through AB 629 <clears throat> and tell you how you can take advantage of this law now. There's a timeline on it. So don't go anywhere. Be sure to tune in next Saturday at 10 a.m. My name is Dr. Anissa McNeil and my co-host is... 
Christina Fitz. And we'll be here on the NAACP Anti-Trafficking Radio Show every Saturday at 10. And Reverend Shaw, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. All right. Thank you.